like to welcome Dr. Lynch, who owns and operates the Sleep Center on the River Road, corner 125 on the River Road. So thanks everybody for having me. Uh, I also want to thank you just in general for everything you do for the community. I think it's big. Um, but thanks for having me and we're talking about um, pre-hospital non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, it sounds like Kingston and East Kingston both have uh, the OxyPeep and that does come up in the lecture but there's a lot more sort of that I'm going to be covering in the lecture than just what's used maybe in pre-hospital arena. So a little background on me, um, as Bill said, I'm the director of the Sleep Institute across the way there. I did uh, all of my training in Boston, internship, residency, and fellowship, internal medicine, pulmonary critical care medicine, a little bit of sleep, a little bit of allergy as well. Um, I'm boarded in inter internal medicine, pulmonary, and uh, sleep medicine. So a little bit of background on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, it's a, as you all know, it's a mechanical ventilatory support delivered through a face mask or a nasal mask. Uh, there's also nowadays um, these things called little nasal pillows that go right into the nostrils, but they're more for home use rather than pre-hospital use. Um, it's largely indicated nowadays for sleep disordered breathing, the main one being obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it's used to treat respiratory failure um, in the field if they have an intact mental status. Uh, if they're declining, they, they can't follow commands, it's not really a great uh, option in terms of what you should be using in the field. Um, and they also have to have good airway reflexes, they, can, they have to have a gag. Um, it provides respiratory support without the complications of endotracheal, endotracheal intubation, including infection and breakdown of the airway. There are two major big players in the field of positive airway pressure. One is called continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. And basically what that is is that it's a constant flow of pressure through inhalation and exhalation. BiPAP is a bi-level therapy. You see a higher pressure when you breathe in and a lower pressure when you breathe out. And it alternates up and down. In general, the machines are bigger. The BiPAP machines are bigger than the CPAP machines. They're more bulky, more expensive, and they're not used as much in terms of in the pre-hospital arena. Background on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, there's actually disagreement in the literature as to whether CPAP is truly non-invasive positive pressure ventilation because CPAP just delivers one flow of air all the time. It doesn't actually allow for a change in minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is how many liters in and out we're doing per minute. And so all it does is provide one flow of air. So technically it's not a ventilator. However, because CPAP allows for the alveoli to stay open, it allows for better gas exchange and therefore you can get oxygen and carbon dioxide out better and that serves as a ventilator in terms of getting rid of your carbon dioxide. So even though in the literature CPAP you know, technically is not a ventilator per se, uh, it, it is in this talk. We're going to talk about CPAP as being a mode of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So as I was searching the literature and finding articles to focus in on, um, I came across an article in 2004 that looked at non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and specifically for acute pulmonary edema, somebody in uh, CHF. Um, there was a randomized prospective controlled trial looking at oxygen, CPAP, or BiPAP for acute pulmonary edema. There were 80 pa patients in the group there were two treatment groups, the CPAP group and the BiPAP group, and they found that in the patients that were just treated with oxygen, 11 patients out of 26 needed to be intubated versus in the other two groups, in the CPAP group and the BiPAP group, two out of 27 in each of those groups needed to be intubated. So there was evidence there to say, you know what, CPAP and BiPAP are resulting in lower uh, rates of endotracheal intubation and maybe we should be using this in the field. <clears throat> um, another study came out, uh, there was one in 97 and then 2006, two, two more studies, uh, now looking at 
CPAP versus BiPAP, not necessarily you know combining it with oxygen. I mean, combining it with oxygen, but just CPAP and BiPAP groups. Meta-analysis comparing CPAP, BiPAP, and conventional therapy, which would be the bag valve mask, uh, non, uh, the non-rebreather. <coughs> and CPAP and BiPAP, BiPAP were both found to reduce the um, need for intubation. And CPAP was reduced with, or uh, was associated with a reduced mortality, but BiPAP was not. And BiPAP, they thought, you know, it improves ventilation and vital signs uh, tend to get better a little bit more quickly than CPAP, but in one of the studies it showed that they had an increased incidence of uh, uh, MI, and the BiPAP machines were more expensive, so because of that, people are using CPAP instead. This is an article that unfortunately I don't have in the handouts except for the one that you got, because I think I just <laughs> printed it from work. I just added this in about an hour ago, only because this article came out this month, and um, it was a retrospective study done in New Jersey. There was a large EMS group in New Jersey, and they went from January 1st of 2005 to December 31st of 2006, um, and they looked at severe heart failure patients um, pre-hospital. Over 1,300 charts were reviewed. There were about 400 patients included in this study, and what they looked at were in order to be included in the study, your respiratory rate had to be above 25, you had to have labored breathing, you have to have shallow breathing, bibasilar bi rails, a history of CHF, intact mental status, and a pre-hospital diagnosis of CHF. And those patients, 387 of them, were included in the study. And what they found was that the oxygen levels on CPAP were better, improved, in 9% of the CPAP versus 5% of the non-CPAP patients. Systolic blood pressure came down by 21 millimeters of mercury versus about 20 in the other group. Diastolic came down 14 versus 7. Heart rate was reduced by 17 beats per minute compared to about 10 in the non-CPAP group. Respiratory rate came down about 5.5 versus 4, and then intubation rates came down. There were 2.6 needing to be intubated versus 5.5 patients needed to be intubated in the other group. So, this just came out this month, and it's really sort of suggesting that you know we should be using the CPAP more in the, especially the acute pulmonary edema patients in in, uh, in the field before they get to the hospital. A little bit of history on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, it's been around for a while. In the 1930s, um, we started seeing CPAP being used for pulmonary edema, asthma, and pneumonia. In the 60s, it was used for post-cardiac, pediatric, and neonatal highland membrane disease. In the 60s and 70s, uh, it was used more in ARDS and COPD patients. In the 80s, there's, there was a huge flux of using CPAP for sleep apnea um, with flow and pressure sensors. BiPAP came out in the 1990s, and now there's just all sorts of PAPs on the market. It's, it's, it's really incredible. Um, so there's, there's CPAP, Continuous positive airway pressure, BiPAP, a bi-level therapy. VPAP stands for variable positive airway pressure. APAP is auto-adjusting positive airway pressure. BiPAP auto SV is a servo ventilation. It acts more like a ventilator, um, and it's used for the complex sleep apnea patients or patients who have central apneas. Um, BiPAP ST is spontaneous timed. You can actually set a bi-level therapy and you can set number of breaths per minute that they get, so you can really control their minute ventilation better. And there's also a VPAP-3 STA, which is more or less a ventilator. They use it for uh, uh, kids who need ventilation or adults who need ventilation at home. Um, more about the history, since the 1980s, um, there's been widespread use of positive airway pressure, CPAP and BiPAP, in the ICUs, in the CCUs, in the ER, uh, it's easily applied. Um, it has steadily grown, use has steadily grown uh, in the pre-hospital arena in the last 10 to 15 years, but in the, in the hospital arena, it's probably been there for, I'm going to say 20, 30 years, because when I was in residency in, in, uh, in Boston, you know, we were using it then. <coughs> um, the most common use in the pre-hospital world is acute pulmonary edema, and in general, uh, airway pressures are usually given somewhere between four and 20 millimeters of mercury. However, um, I think 
I read in the literature that really in the pre-hospital arena, it's usually five to 10 millimeters of mercury. I mean, I, I go up to, in my office, 20, 20, 22, 24, you know, I have people on higher pressures, but I think in the, in the pre-hospital world, usually five to, five to 10 is all that you'll end up doing before you get to the hospital. So why, why use CPAP? What, is, you know, what are the benefits of CPAP? It decreases work of breathing, it reduces rates of intubation, and it reduces mortality. So those are three big ones. And as I said before, it's not a ventilator, but it does provide some artificial respiration and acts like a ventilator. <coughs> um, getting more to the uh, sort of pathophysiologic benefits of CPAP, what does it do? It improves compliance. What is compliance? Well, by definition, compliance is a change in volume for any change in pressure. But really, it's how well can the air get in and out of your lungs? That's compliance. How, how, how well can you, you know, open and close them, the ease of opening and closing your lungs? Um, CPAP can recruit atelectatic alveoli, so I often describe to patients that uh, alveoli, like everybody sitting in this room right now, we're, we're not, you know, running or exercising, so a lot of our lung tissue is like wet tissue paper wet tissue paper and it, it just sort of is folded on itself and when we take a deep breath in we sort of open that up and the lining of our airways are, are, are coated with surfactant and surfactant is this really nice viscous uh, fluid that allows us to open and close easily and nothing gets stuck on its, uh, on its other and, um, and surfactant allows our, li our, our lungs to be very very compliant and so that's physiology wise that's how it works um, CPAP also increases the surface area or the area of gas exchange because it's opening up some alveoli. It's allowing more gas exchange, more area for gas exchange. It reduces the ventilation perfusion mismatch. It doesn't reduce the ratio because if you think about it, ventilation to perfusion, if you have you know, a 1 to 10, then that's not very good. Uh, that's a bad mismatch because it's 1 tenth. But if you have 1 to 1, then that's a, a much, much better match. So it's actually improving that VQ mismatch uh, by, by allowing more ventilation. Um, it increases the hydrostatic pressure uh, because lots of times the, the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure is that the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is higher than the pressure in the alveoli. So fluid ends up leaking into the alveoli. So if you apply a pressure and you blow up the alveoli, the fluid will start moving the other direction. It shifts edema back into the interstitial space in the, in the alveolar space. Um, in general, it increases interthoracic pressure, which can help cardiac output. It decreases uh, venous return to the heart, so it decreases preload. It decreases the transmural pressure across the heart, which decreases afterload and helps cardiac output. It decreases air trapping. Um, in COPD patients. It allows for better exhalation, the ease of being able to exhale, um, and it decreases the work of the diaphragm, which is your main respiratory muscle. So, a little bit about cost. Um, there was a study done in 2008 in North Carolina, and they looked at acute pulmonary edema patients. They found that four out of a thousand EMS patients required CPAP. In their setting, CPAP cost approximately $90 as a consumable on the, on the truck. It saved 0.75 lives per 100,000 or per 1,000. Uh, the cost per life save was $490. It, it resulted in less, one intubation less per six usages of CPAP. And then overall, in the hospital, it result, re resulted in over a $4,000 cost savings. So it sort of made sense to start introducing CPAP in the field to be able to cut down on the intubation needed within the hospital and therefore shorten the length of stay of patients, and it really made sense. <clears throat> so this section of the talk, I'm going to be uh, talking more about sort of the physiology. I'll go over the respiratory pathway. I'll review that a little bit. I'll review oxygenation and ventilation, uh, FRC, and the work of breathing. <clears throat>